Hello, I'm Kenneth D. King, designer, teacher, and a contributing editor for Threads Magazine. And I have good news. My in-depth smart tailoring class is available in an updated online format. It covers the process of creating a beautifully tailored jacket from selecting materials to finishing details. This class is an incredible value for more than five hours of instruction, almost the equivalent of a college course in tailoring. In this course, I will be covering what I call old school as well as new school tailoring. Old school is the classic set of methods used in making a bespoke jacket. I developed my new school tailoring because I needed a way to produce the same results as the old school methods, but more efficiently. To develop these methods, I studied the old school methods with an eye towards determining exactly why something was done a particular way, and then inventing a method that would produce the same results in a more time-efficient manner. These methods, old school and new school, are presented side by side, first for comparison, but as well as comparing, they are presented to show that you don't have to use one or the other set of techniques, but you can combine both methods in one garment. That's the beauty of this series. It shows you how to make the best use of time to make the best garment for you. This class is available on demand anytime. You can watch and learn when you have the time and return to the class again and again to review. Sign up for yourself or give Smart Tailoring as a gift. Visit threadsmagazine.com or threads.mykajabi, spelled M-Y-K-A-J-A-B-I dot com to find out more and to sign up. Hello, and welcome to Sewing with Threads, the podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I am Sarah McFarland, the Editorial Director, and today our special guest is Alex Beard, also known as the Obsessive Costuming Dude. Alex, welcome to the podcast, and could you tell our audience a little bit about what it is you do? Hi, Sarah. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. As you said, I'm Alex. I usually go by Obsessive Costuming Dude on social media. I research and blog about costumes from my favorite shows and movies. I discuss the screen-used costumes, both for a general audience of anyone interested in this kind of thing, but especially for people who want to make their own replica costumes as close to the originals as possible. I write costume analyses and sewing tutorials, and I offer patterns for costumes that I've studied on uh, my website, taylorsgonewild.com. I specialize in Star Trek costumes, but I do branch out into other things too, like Doctor Who. And I'm working on a series of sewing and tailoring courses specifically for people who want to learn to make costumes. Well, Alex, I think what you do is really fascinating. And I first came across your work because I'm a huge Star Trek fan and I've made uh, costumes from commercial patterns before. And then I was looking for something that was a little more advanced, a little more um, screen accurate. And I came across your patterns uh, on a blog. And in the background, if you're watching the video version, I have my Star Trek The Next Generation uniform. I won a costume contest with this uniform and it was so much fun to make. And I realized that Alex was doing something really impressive. Uh, You carefully analyzed a screen worn costume. You gave fantastic graded uh, pattern for it and very detailed instructions. So I thought I want to talk to this guy. I want to find out more about what he does. So do you have any background in costume design or how did you learn to sew? Well, um, I don't know if you've seen those T-shirts that uh, they say everything I learned about this, I I learned from this. And it's usually, you know, something silly. Everything I learned about, you know, parenting, I learned from this. Everything I learned about relationships, I learned from this. Uh, I I should have one that says everything I learned about sewing or everything I know about sewing, I learned from Star Trek. Which isn't entirely true. Not anymore. But that's definitely what got me started. I loved Star Trek as a kid, and Star Trek inspired a lot of people to want to become scientists or astronauts or whatever, but I always wanted to be the the starship captain. And 
that's that's kind of what uh, what drove me in that direction. And I finished high school at North Carolina, what was then called North Carolina School of the Arts, studying music. And the graduation, uh, well, it was an art school, and we were encouraged to express ourselves in um, you know whatever way we we wanted to. And the graduation was just kind of a, a free for all. We got to wear whatever we wanted to graduation, and. At that time, my love for Star Wars was at an all-time high, and I wanted to be a Jedi for my uh, high school graduation. So my first costume was something I completely just slapped together, had no idea what I was doing, no idea at all. The the fabric, I want to say it was like a dollar a yard something from Walmart. I didn't have a sewing machine. Um, I didn't know anything. I, I put, I didn't have a pattern. I just put some fabric on the floor of the dorm and cut it out, made it with a, just a basic. Like Alex, these were sort of Jedi robes you were creating. Yeah. 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 yeah, Like a, like Jedi robes. Uh, No idea what I was doing. It's a miracle that this thing didn't fall off my body. Like as I was walking across (laughs) the stage and everything, I don't know how it, how it stayed on. I just did. It was just a running stitch. That's, that's all I could fathom how to do. I thought that's all there was to sewing, but uh, I, I was, Super happy with it. It was a terrible costume, but I was thrilled at the time. And not long after that, my grandma bought me a sewing machine. She, uh, I assume she wanted to, you know, kind of encourage me. She made pocketbooks and purses and stuff for, for women. She didn't make clothes, but she saw, maybe she saw, you know, something she wanted she to nurture. She wanted to encourage that, that in you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so I had my first sewing machine. I was thrilled. No idea how to use it. <laughs> I had no idea, different stitches, different needles nothing i i didn't know what a bobbin was i didn't know anything and um i bought a couple star trek fan patterns for some uniforms because like i said you know that's kind of what i always wanted to do i bought these patterns and they were just awful they were terrible they turned me off of sewing for years i uh, they i don't want to name any names either but i've I've also had that experience Yeah. yeah Yeah. Some some of them are very good, but you know the ones that I got are <laughs> they they were um, they were not as as good. Um, that's that's all I'll say. So for for years I I didn't um, I didn't do any sewing. I, I started dabbling again after college, but I, I still had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't have a have a clue. I eventually picked up enough just from osmosis and experience. I, I burned through enough fabric. I wasted so much fabric trying to learn just the, the basic stuff. I read enough pattern instructions. I watched enough YouTube videos, which were particularly bad back then. And and not HD either, you know, 360p, 480p, terrible library music in the background, just distracting. It was It was awful. And Anyway, and I, I Googled a lot of stuff, too, just very specific stuff, how to do this, how to do, you know, whatever. And uh, interestingly, when I was Googling things, Threads Magazine came up a lot because I was Googling how to do very specific things. And um, I found how to how to miter the corner of a Hong Kong finish. You know, that was a, something Kenneth King contributed. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was an article. Well, I'm so glad our content yeah. encouraged you at that point. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I learned quite a bit just uh, Googling very, it wasn't like how to sew, you know, it was like very specific, you know, how to, how to do this specific sewing thing. Yes. Yes. You know, and um, I remember when I worked on my costume, the collar, you referred to a Kenneth, a technique for the collar assembly, right. which was very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you found that helpful. I, I, I mean, I'm just passing along something I learned from, <laughs> from, from him. I can't really take credit for that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I learned a lot there. Um, I picked up a lot all over the place. Um, around that time, uh, Catherine and I started dating and we were both really interested in sewing and costuming. Uh, we were at about kind of a similar intermediate sewing level, but uh, we enjoyed talking about it a lot while we were, while we were dating and we, we were coming at it from totally different perspectives. I was coming at it from a very uh, sci-fi Star Trek background and, and I'd learned to do things like, uh, you know, installing invisible zippers and sewing corners and wedges 
she was coming at it from more of a, a renaissance background. She, she liked renaissance festivals and medieval fantasy, that kind of thing. So she knew how to do a lot of things that I didn't know how to do. She knew about, um, you know, working with trims and, and bias tapes and ribbons and eyelets and a lot of that fun stuff that goes into that. So once we, uh, we got married and uh, kind of absorbed each other's skills, at least to, to some degree, you know, I was very interested. I've always been very interested in learning. I wanted to, she knew a lot of stuff I didn't know. I knew a lot of stuff she didn't know. And we kind of, you know, we, we traded. Then I worked, I, I managed to get a job working at a tailor shop for a while. And it, the, the, it was a husband and a wife who ran the tailor shop. They're Asian American immigrants. And he learned about tailoring when he was in a North Vietnamese prison. He was South Vietnamese and he was in prison and he learned about tailoring from another prisoner who they didn't even have a sewing machine or, or, or thread or anything. They drew lines in the dirt and that's how he learned to sew. He and his now wife escaped the prison in like a tiny little raft and that's where he learned tailoring and they eventually immigrated to America. But he was just the nicest, like most positive a uh, very uh, encouraging, very affirming teacher. But he kind of took me under his wing kind of as a as a sidekick or as an apprentice and uh, taught me a, a lot of things. My, my, my first task was hemming pants, which I didn't know how to do. I could make these, you know, advanced Star Trek costumes and stuff. But I honestly, a basic hem, I didn't know how to do that. There were a lot of holes in my in my knowledge. And he had me hemming pants like right then and there, no pinning, no, no anything. And and some of these pants, they were, they were really nice pants. Some of them were, you know, hundreds of dollars, just these, these clothes. And he just turned me loose. And that's a, you know, what a way to learn. No pressure. Did that that bring you a lot of, uh, not only the speed, but more confidence in your sewing skills? Oh, absolutely. Um, And that was, that was my uh, first time using a commercial sewing machine too. It only used home machines at that point. And you have to have a degree of confidence to use one of those because it's like, (laughs) it was very on the spot learning, but um, you know, I I learned a lot there. I. So you've got this, um, this enthusiasm for Star Trek and Star Wars. Uh, You've got, you know, your own, creative ability. You've had this experience at the tailor shop. Your wife is interested in it too. And then how did this come all together? What was the first screen costume you worked with to create a pattern? The journey to creating screen used costumes is, uh, I don't know if it's an interesting one, but uh, I'll just mention it real quick. When, when I started, I, um, I didn't really have any real thought or, or plan to uh, a line of sewing patterns for people who wanted to make costumes or anything. It was my first sewing pattern was really an afterthought. I'd made my own Star Trek formal uniform for my wedding. And at the time I was really happy with how it turned out. I got a lot of compliments and I thought there might be some other people who wanted to make one too. So I graded it in a few other sizes and we tossed it up on Etsy just to see what would happen. Some people bought it and things went well. I, uh, it was encouraging. So I did some more patterns over the years, just, um, you know, eyeballing it based on screen caps and filling in the details with, you know, my best guesses, like the, um, like the frog DNA in, in Jurassic Park, you know, like <laughs> I, I don't really have the complete picture, but I'll do this right there and it'll be fine. I didn't really have any experience with professional patterning or anything, but my early patterns went together fine and, and people seemed to like them. There was a lot of positive feedback and a lot of interest and in requests for more, um, but it was it was really just my hobby at the at the time. And in my other life, I'm a media composer and I was just doing this costuming stuff on the side. I would make a costume, whatever I wanted to make for myself. And then as it wasn't really an afterthought anymore, but kind of the extra mile, I would just put it in a few different sizes, toss it up online and I would just take photos of my process and and toss it up on a blog or as a PDF just for other anyone else who wanted to make it to. And after a few years, I realized that this was really becoming a thing. It was really, it was really snowballing. And if I wanted to keep doing it, I, I really wanted to commit to doing it really well. 
not just well, but really well. So I got a lot more thorough with my costume research before I even started the pattern itself. I read some pattern books. I studied a bunch of retail patterns. I learned to work with pattern blocks. And a big thing was I learned how uh, I learned about patterning for women in women's garments, which I'd never had to do before because I only made things I for me. I wanted to ask you if we could go back to, I didn't, sure. I didn't realize this, that you wore one of your costumes to get married. I think that's wonderful. What that, did, that was my and, dream. If I got married, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, wear a, a Star Trek, probably a formal uniform. I, 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 I hadn't really pictured any one specific uniform, but I knew if I ever got married, I definitely, you know, wanted it to be uh, something special and, and meaningful for, for me. And that kind of thing would be something that would be special and meaningful for whoever I married it to, or otherwise yes. I probably wouldn't be interested in, in marrying them. Our wedding was very, very nerdy. Lots and lots of costumes at our wedding, lots of nerdy quotes from our favorite shows and movies. Cause uh, Catherine's a big nerd too. Uh, I made, what did, what did I made Catherine the groomsmen's costumes. Too? She made her wedding dress and she made all the, um, all or most of the bridesmaid dresses. And I made, uh, my groomsmen costumes and um, our minister was my dad. We dressed him up as Gandalf and um, <laughs> we invited everyone to come in costume who, who wanted to come. Uh, I nicknamed it wedding con. Oh, I don't that's know so that, fun. I love that's that. still around anymore, but uh, that was kind of the idea behind it. it we wanted it to be, uh, you know, fun and expressive of, of who we are, you know, as, as people. So um, yeah, our, our wedding, lots of costumes there um but yeah uh i'll send you a picture of that too i don't know if, if oh, you want we'll, to show it yeah, to yeah. anyone yeah i should who, i should mention that we'll be able to that. share a lot of the photos of the costumes and things that we've talked about in the show notes for this episode because i know you have a lot okay, of visuals great. to provide and i want to give people a really good idea of the the level of skill and expertise that you're bringing to this so that's that's a great story yeah well, um where did, where did I leave off? We started talking about my wedding. Uh, oh, oh, oh uh, I, I learned about I learned about women's stuff, Costumes. which yeah. um, which was the, uh, a whole plunge <laughs> in and of itself. Because, like I said, I never I never uh, I made things for me, and I did patterns, you know, in other sizes as uh, kind of kind of an afterthought. But but I knew I really wanted to take it up to the next level. I, I'd gotten good at at eyeballing it, or. I think I had, but I began realizing that there's a lot of nuance and detail to the original costumes that you, you can't really gauge or determine just from visual references externally. There's a special, you know, magic to them. And there's also a lot of mystique around these costumes too. A lot of people, they, they wonder how certain things were done, like how, how they were structured, how you get in and out of them, what color the fabrics were. That kind of thing. So I, I kind of took it on myself to start demystifying these costumes for anyone else who's interested. And now I work directly off of screen use costumes whenever possible, which is my favorite way to work. And you asked about the first one that I studied. Yes. The, 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 first, the first one I studied in person was a TNG scant. Should I explain what that is? Do, do we you should. Think people and know? I was I was thinking I don't know how much we can use on the acronyms in this episode. Oh. So we'll say we'll say the next generation and uh, a scant. Yeah, if you could explain what a scant is. Scant. Okay. How how, how to explain this for people who <laughs> don't know? It's a it's a unisex uniform style by costume designer William Wertice that was mainly seen during the first season of The Next Generation as an alternative to the jumpsuit uniform. It had short sleeves, a mini skirt, and no pants. And it was worn by both women and men. I think it was supposed to be like an ideological or philosophical statement on gender equality in the future, but for whatever reason, they didn't they didn't last very long in the show. But there's a lot of interest in them now, though, 30 years later. So they got people talking and, and they were memorable. And if you go to a con, you'll probably see at least at least one person walking around in, in, a, in a scant, uh, both men and women. And I was thinking about doing patterns for these. I'd gotten asked about them, but they're they're really weird. 
not not just like philosophically, but I mean like structurally. Oh, like how the, so? The, the the pattern. William Murtice was a very out of the box costume designer. He didn't know how to sew. And he would just come up with the wackiest stuff that it was up to his team to figure out how to actually make this. And um, these scants have two crisscrossed invisible zippers on the front. And there's this strange, like, asymmetrical paneling underneath that, that goes kind of halfway between the legs. It really has to be seen to be I'm really believed. intrigued now. I'm going to have to try one of these patterns. Maybe, yeah, it, maybe I can wear it with tights. <laughs> you, can, you can look at some um, photos on my blog, uh, StarTrekCostumeGuide.com. I, the, the scant that I examined, I took a bazillion photos of and everything. And then there's a tutorial for it on my blog if, if you're interested in that. And they did wear them with pants in the second season. They did show up. If you, there was a different costume designer in season two. Dorinda Rice Wood took over. And I don't know if it was her call or the producer's call or whatever, but they were um, they were always worn with corresponding trousers in season two. So if you're, if you're self-conscious about wearing a mini skirt, you know, you have that, that option, but most of the people, um, who, who like these wear them, you know, without pants, they, they, they really lean into it. They really embrace the, the campy, like weird, you know, whatever vibe. (laughs) But I, I was trying to figure out how these were made. I, I, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it without seeing one, in person so i posted on a form there was a form specifically you know for people interested in making star trek costumes there were some facebook groups with some uh collectors and people who own this stuff and and i just asked if anyone owned a screen use scant and could help answer my questions and a really nice guy named steve barnes answered and he offered to help he sent me some or he described it for me and he sent me some photos uh for reference of the screen use scant that that he owned which you know, I was still having trouble wrapping my brain around this bizarre costume design. So I asked him if he'd be willing to loan it to me so I could study it for a little while. I know he, he'd loaned it to another guy for a photo shoot and I just asked him and uh, he agreed, which I really appreciated. At that point, it was a it was a pretty big ask because um a lot of people knew who I was in the costuming and cosplaying communities, but uh, not so much in the collector community because I, I'm not personally a, a collector. I don't really have any interest in owning screen used costumes. My uh, my interest is really in in studying them, and I, I I am a collector, but I collect information about them, right? And I and I post it up for everyone. Uh, I'm, I I collect more intangible things. I'm much more interested in learning how they were made and replicating them. Um, and at that point, uh, I was not very well known in the collector's community. So it was a, it was a fairly big ask. Uh, one fellow named Angelo Cafaldi, he has an amazing collection of screen-used costumes. And he's let me study quite a few of them, uh, which I'll be blogging about soon. I have a huge backlog of stuff to to blog about. And he's working on converting part of his house into a display area, like a TNG-themed display area. Oh, how fun! Of all his mannequins and all his computer graphics and, and props and everything. Um, it's just like a whole area of his house he's converting so it looks, you know, very uh, like a TNG set with mannequins of all his costumes and everything. He's been a big supporter. And uh, most recently, a guy named Ray Minarsik lent me an engineering radiation suit from the movies, like uh, like the one I have back here. That's that's not his. That's my replica. But um, We should describe that wanted... very briefly for our, our <laughs> listening audience. Uh, behind Alex, you can see this radiation suit. And I remember, it, let's see, it was in the, the motion picture, Star Trek motion picture. They wore them mm-hmm. and definitely in The Wrath of Khan. And this suit, you had spoken to me a little bit about how it was a very different experience for you because it has a lot more like physical details and Mm -hmm. uh, little add-ons on it. Whereas the typical uniform might be quite clean. Uh, Could you, do you want to talk a little bit about the radiation suit and that experience? Uh, Sure. It was a very, like you said, it was a very different experience for me. Everything I've worked on so far has been, um, 
they've been very different costumes, you know, from like the TNG jumpsuit behind you. It's jumbo spandex skin tight jumpsuit to, you know, more structured things like uh, tailored suits and jackets and waistcoats and, and frock coats, you know, period stuff and theatrical stuff to, you know, more structured things like the um, the later TNG costumes, the the wool jackets and and all that. But but they're all like they've all been they've always been fabric based right like yes. they're all very very different but they're very different costumes very different designs very different uh styles sewing and everything but this this was a totally new thing for me and and challenging in that there's uh it's not all fabric the the black color up top is neoprene it's thick neoprene like you might see on like a i don't know maybe a yoga mat or like in a tool chest to set your tools down oh, sure on um it's and neoprene and within the context the, of the show these were protective suits oh yeah to, to work I, I guess the the aesthetic or the implication was if you were engineering is like a hazardous place to work and you need protective suits to work in there you know that was uh it is brilliant costume design robert fletcher was the costume designer for the first four original series movies and these radiation suits showed up in all six movies um but there were two different costume designers for the last two movies so you know different costume designers do different things with them and and you know tweak tweak them to put their own little stamps on them and everything but you know like you said there's a lot of hardware on this costume that, that was just little found bits here and there that uh Robert Fletcher, he was very resourceful and in, in working on a budget, and he had to find little bits, which I assume he just raided a hardware store, and, and took these very familiar things and used them in a way that created this kind of familiarity, but like a vague familiarity and like a mystique around them where parts of it look familiar, but you can't quite put your finger on it, but it has a, it has a purpose, but you know, you've seen it before, but you don't know where. And, um, it's fascinating to me because I am not a costume designer. I don't have a costume design bone in my body. I, I'm an analytical person. Um, I, I study things and from an engineering perspective, I'm interested in reproducing them. But uh, in terms, I could—I don't think I could design an original costume to, to save my life. <laughs> so I'm continually amazed at the work of these costume designers on things like Star Trek, where they uh, they have to come up with this stuff because you can't just go to a store and buy, uh, you know, a 23rd century engineering radiation suit, right? Like, or or, exactly. or you have to come TNT up with jumpsuit. a way to make it look believable and and, and, mm-hmm. and source all of the parts and i think it's right. i think you have where you're coming from is a great perspective for the the costume makers in all of us who want to recreate those looks ha- having this detailed yeah. analysis yeah i i can say i would have probably never tried this if i didn't have a screen use costume to to work from because it's just too – there's so much nuance and detail going on that you – beyond what you would ever see in the actual you know, movies. And um, getting to hold it in my hands and, and with the measuring tape, with the ruler, with the seam gauge and everything and look at all the parts and see exactly how this thing was made, what order it was made in, reverse engineering it, that's all uh, – almost indispensable to what I do now the at the I don't want to sound pretentious but the level that I do it and the level that I like to work uh patterning off of and learning to replicate screen use costumes like that is my favorite way to work and I, I work that way whenever I can now, Alex so, you've created a YouTube video about your analysis of the radiation suit um, I know you have a new pattern including a men's and a women's version, and you also posted your analysis. And I was wondering to give to give our listeners and our audience an idea of what went into that. Approximately, how many photos or how long is your analysis? Do you think on the blog? the The radiation suit one is the longest and most intense one that I've ever done in terms of like one examination. I lots of people have apparently read it, and I don't. I I'm amazed that people made it to the end because it's so it's the longest blog post I've ever written in my life. I want to say it's it's at least 8,000 maybe upwards of 9,000 words. And it is a fun read though because you inject a lot of humor. I I love the the shots you put in from the series. So, you know, for any Star Trek fan, it doesn't it, you don't just don't have to necessarily want to make the radiation suit, but it's a fascinating 
read and a fascinating look at the show. That's kind of you to say, and that, that's kind of what I go for too. And I think that's why there's so much support from collectors now is because they kind of like what I was saying earlier, they enjoy reading about this thing, even if they don't have an interest in reproducing it themselves for costuming purposes or cosplay purposes or where to a convention or anything. They, uh, I think a lot of them enjoy reading about the history of these costumes and when and how they were used and who wore what, because, you know, from their perspective, they've spent a lot of money on these pieces of memorabilia from entertainment. And so, so it's clearly important to them. You know, they clearly love, the show or the movies or whatever enough to shell out a lot of money on these collector's items, these screen used items, but they're coming from more of a a collector's memorabilia perspective. So they value memorabilia and the context of all that. So I keep in mind when I'm, when I'm writing those, I I keep in mind, I'm, I'm kind of writing for a dual audience. I'm writing for people who do and don't know how to sew. And the people who don't know how to sew probably skim past a lot of the, the, you know, super intricate detailing like one inch seam allowances on the sides and half inch seam allowances here and you know top stitching here they they probably don't know work here but some of the more general stuff you're asking about length uh, i think that post had over 400 visual references i think about 300 of them were my own photos of the costume and then 100 or 150 screen caps and auction photos from you know the movies and auction listings and everything referencing all the all the different things but um there's there's a lot that goes into it, and I, I try to always keep in mind who I'm writing for. Obviously, the sewing tutorials for how to make these are exclusively for the sewing DIY crowd. I don't know how many people would be interested in reading this if they're not at least vaguely interested in <laughs> yes. learning how to make their own, because that would, seems like that would just be a tremendous waste of time. But the, the actual costume research, studying the screen use costumes, the analyses and everything, I think, I think people... Um, from both communities uh, seem to be interested in that because it's kind of like a, it's like a preliminary uh, do your homework before you make this costume kind of thing. If you care to some, some people don't, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, And then people who collect regardless of whether or not they're interested in sewing. Alex, what are some of the interesting construction elements that you've discovered in the screen worn costumes, say, as opposed to what you might find in a commercial Uh, pattern for one of these costumes it's kind of like i was saying earlier there's a lot of nuance to the costumes that um particularly with william where tice's designs from early tng because that's what i've done the most of uh the last few years there's there's not a straight line anywhere like the tng jumpsuit you have in, in in the background there um, since studying the screen used, I, I've learned that uh, every seam has at least a tiny little bit of curvature. It looks like a straight seam while it's being worn. Most of them do anyway, but usually there's just the, the, the slightest, you know, kind of fitted curve to a lot of the seams where a lot of the seams function like fitting darts or, um, you know, they're, they're taken in just a little bit here and there. And I noticed that the, in construction because it, okay, it was, it was a good jumpsuit, just period. Just like if I were looking to sew a jumpsuit, it's an excellent jumpsuit. It has a great fit and very flattering lines to it. Uh, the yoke seam going, extending across the shoulders, it gives you this. Yeah, it's a weird, yeah, it's a weird yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the diagonal the seam. Uh, across the abdomen and there's a little bit of fitting there so you know it kind of tucks in it's not a a shapeless jumpsuit and yet and and i'm sure this is exactly what the costume designers were going for you feel really sort of take charge and like you could accomplish anything in this comfortable stretchy jumpsuit yeah 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 you put on the costume and and it it feels good like when you when you've done it well like you have and you know it's fitted to you you know the the photos that i saw um for, for anyone listening sarah did a uh a review on patternreview.com for a contest and, and won the contest. Yeah, it was the, 2019, so it was a little while ago, but yeah. yeah. What technique do you use to copy the shape of the pieces for the patterns? Uh, do you use a rub-off technique or something else? Short answer is, yes, uh, the rub-off technique. For anyone listening who doesn't know what that is, you take a, a piece of thin fabric, like muslin, and you pin or tailor-based it to 
whatever you're copying. And this doesn't just with screen use costumes. You can do this with anything. Um, Absolutely. You... And we have a couple articles. So I can I can refer the, the audience. Oh, well, they, the already, they already know what it is. Yeah. I'm not going to waste anyone's time. <laughs> but basically, basically, you just trace the pattern off. And um, I measure all the seams a bazillion times uh, just to confirm what it's supposed to be because there's always a bit of drift when you're tracing a pattern uh, especially a, a very three-dimensional fitted pattern it's not going to lie flat while you're doing it so i i check before and this seam should be exactly ten and a half inches long or or you know three and three quarter inches or, or whatever it's supposed to be so i measure it every which way to to and that's the target that i'm aiming at and check against after i do the trace pattern and, you know, then I true the seams with all the uh, the appropriate rulers, the the French curve ruler, the hip curve ruler, the, the straight ruler, all the all the stuff and the pattern drafting paper. And then add all the allowances back in, because obviously when you trace a pattern, the allowances aren't going to be there. And then I use that. It usually now uh, the trace patterns that I do, the rub off patterns, I actually post those on my blog for free because they're straight off a screen use costume. And then I grade it into other sizes. And then that's the pattern that I actually sell on my website, Taylor's Gone Wild. It's a whole process. You have male and female costumes or costumes for men and women. And did you, are those copied off of costumes for men and women? Or did you uh, extrapolate one from the other? Uh, both. So, sometimes it depends on the pattern. Some of them I will have just uh, one gender or the other. And I've done my homework. So I know how the screen use costumes were different. Um, but you know, maybe the men's sleeves were a little shorter, or maybe the women's skirt was a little fuller on the scant, you know, for example, or maybe the collars were a little taller on the women versus the the men, that kind of thing. Um, I like to pattern off of both genders, men and men's and women's whenever I can. Uh, but there are some where I just look at one or the other and I, I, uh, kind of modify or adjust it accordingly to make the corresponding pattern. With my patterns and tutorials, I just want to point out that context is everything with studying a screen use costume. Studying any screen use costume is an amazing and fascinating experience, at least for me. It's not like you look at one costume and can immediately conclude that that's how it was always done, because that's not at all the case. The The uniforms evolved a lot over the years, they, they, they changed and there were different costume designers over the years too, that were stuck using the same uniforms and they wanted to put their own kind of spins and adaptations on it. Uh, the costumes varied among the cast and the productions too. And sometimes there might be a uniform that's only ever worn by one character that none of the other characters wore. Or sometimes the uniforms were done this way on this show, but the same uniforms were looked a little bit different on a different show if a character, those uniforms showed up on one of the other spinoffs, you know, that, that might be a different wardrobe department that made that uniform. So, you know, context is, is everything when looking at a screen use costume. And uh, I have kind of a, a hierarchy of how much um, emphasis to uh, place or infer from whatever the screen use costume I'm, I'm studying is. So, Kind of at the top is the the show's captain or commander, the the main character of the show, the star of the show, is like the usually like the holy grail. This is going to be the nicest thing made for the show because it's made for the star of the show. And kind of right beneath that is main character costumes. Uh, any of the main characters, a lot of effort's going to be made into those because this is the the cast of you the main cast of your show they're going to be made probably with the best materials the best ways nothing phoned in no expense spared these these, these are hero uniforms is, is okay. uh what they're, what they're commonly That's called the term. yeah right under that would be i think recurring character costumes uh you know characters that, that they pop in you know a few times a season or, or whatever they probably had a costume that was custom made for them probably and then that costume was used whenever, uh, or, or several costumes rather, it's seldom just one, but, uh, they would pull that off the, off the rack. A lot of effort went into those whenever this character showed up, they need to look good too, because we're going to see them multiple times beneath that. I would say is probably guest stars, usually just in one episode. Maybe they had a costume made just for them, depending on how much they're in the episode. 
uh, if they're front and center, if they're taking, you know, center stage or if, or if they're just kind of hanging out on the sidelines, you know, maybe, maybe it was just a, a production made costume. They just pull off the rack cause it fit and they didn't have a lot of screen time and you're under the TV grind. So just if it fits, put them in it. Uh, beneath that, I would say is an extras costume or uh, a background background performer costume. There, there are more of these made than anything for obvious reasons. These are the people that just kind of fill out the frame in the background. You have lots of people walking around or standing around in the background at their at their stations doing doing whatever. Of course, these are still screen use costumes, but they might be lacking some of the detail that the hero costumes have because they're always going to be way in the background, usually blurry. Um, you're not supposed to see very much of them. You know, okay. maybe they're standing behind the main characters. Maybe they're standing behind a console or sitting behind a console. Um, I'm not saying that they, the, the wardrobe department's ever phoned it in or anything because they're still, you know, excellent costumes, but they, they, they're usually patterned differently, at least the ones that I've looked at. The hero costumes and guest character costumes are usually fitted to specific actors. You know, they're, Makes they're sense. Yeah. tailored and fit very well to, to be flattering on that person. But extras costumes, uh, the ones I've seen have had, um, I don't want to say boxier fits. They're certainly not baggier, but they're intended to fit a wider range of people. So there's not as much nuance to the pattern. They're more stock sizes, you know, men's size 40, 42, 44, uh, you know that kind of thing. They're 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 stock sizes. They're they're seldom fit to specific extras. Alex, are they are um, they labeled? Are they labeled uh, by size? Some, some some of them are labeled. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have to think all of them were at some point. Okay. Uh, because if they know, you know, tomorrow we have three extras. One is a women's, you know, with a 34 bus, 28 hips, you know, what do they have to know what to pull off the rack? You know, one right. is a, it's a men's, you know, size 38 chest. He's six feet tall. They have to know like what to pull off and, and put, they, they also often have extra allowances in them too, because they are altered, you know, from the, sense. from the, from the stock sizes, um, the standard numerical sizes, uh, but then at the, near the bottom is stunt costumes. Those are you know, for stunt use. And they're generally, they're either recycled costumes, like the hero costumes, once they got too old to be used, you know, they're too ragged now, we're just going to use it for stunts or extras costumes. Um, sometimes they're, they're, they're lacking in detail or they have like weird stuff in them because if an actor has to wear a harness or something, you know, there'll be openings in the costume to accommodate the stunts. They might have uh, burn marks or, I mean, not you know, burns, you know, the well, spray, spray ask, paint. Yeah, I was going to ask or, about you know. that if they, um, for, for, for danger scenes or, you know, there's a fire or something happens, do they usually, they wouldn't usually damage a hero costume, would they? Sometimes. 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 Okay. Um, but, but usually like an older hero costume, you know, if you're in season five or six, they'll, they'll pull out one of the older costumes from season three that's, you know, showing its, production use you know it's getting a little old they'll pull that out and you know kind of they'll, they'll cut it up and spray paint and you know put some fake blood on it or whatever they use for that and um you know rip it open and if you whatever they need to do for to to distress a cost now distressing a costume and stunt costume are two different things but often stunt costumes will be distressed they're people that have you know they've been shot or or consoles blown up in their face or or whatever um but then at the bottom uh, what I see is the bottom anyway is just a production made costume where we don't really know if this was ever used or who wore it or anything, but it was made by the original people for the production. So okay. it's the real deal. We just, it's just kind of a mystery. We we don't know. So when I look at a screen use costume, I try to always put it in that, in that context. So I know uh, how, how much to base any conclusions from this, because like I said, these are all, done with different intentions for different purposes and to just assume you look at a screen costume their screen use costume they're all done that way that that's not at all the case so so put it in that context and in terms of patterning and tutorials uh in that context you know i I try to make good educated decisions but i also think about you know what do i like what's my favorite style or version do i like the season three version do i like the season seven version uh what looks the most quintessentially uh, or authentic to me or quintessentially, you know, TNG or DS9 or whatever the show is, right? Like, what do I think of when I, do I think this version? Or do I think 
this version. And it's just my opinion, but it's an it's an informed one. And I balance that against what I think the community wants and the community is interested in. How do you think your audience and your customers decide how accurate their costumes should be? Um, well, I, that's a tricky question. Uh, first of all, uh, the more, you know, the more quote unquote accuracy is, is more of a spectrum to how things were done over the years. Kind of, kind of like I was, I was just saying, um, the original costumes varied a lot. There's the context, everything I just mentioned, but you know, they varied a lot over the cast. They evolved over time. They had different costume designers. And even if you're going for 100% screen accuracy, the closest that you could really hope to achieve, I, I think, is probably like a direct replica of a single character's uniform from a single season or even half season of a show. And even then, there's a degree of compromise. Even the most determined customer reaches a point of just diminishing returns around the 95 to 98% range. I just made that number up. It eventually becomes an exercise in futility. Um, you're going to have to compromise even even if you pattern directly off a screen used costume. You know, they weren't always done that way. Uh, there's always some compromise. Like the, the, the fabric color, do you adjust for size? Uh, do you adjust for detailing? Do you have to adjust for your your own skill level? And personally, I want my patterns to be as quote unquote accurate as possible. But my goal is usually to create what I believe to be a, an idealized representation of the costumes from the shows and movies. Um, and the the term accurate is uh, I, I've kind of developed a distaste for this term and i and i avoid using it because i don't want to cultivate any sense of elitism any association with you know accuracy these days is entirely attributed to me by others uh, i usually use the term authentic but i think what's important is you know as a sewer as a customer i think it's important to be authentic to yourself not just authentic to original an original costume and i I think that's a very personal thing. I think the most important thing is to have fun and to make something that you're satisfied with or, or proud of, or ideally both. Um, but one or the other may be more important to you. You know, for some people, they're perfectly content to slap something together and, and have a good time doing it, then they have a good time wearing it. And, and I think that's, yeah, that's great. Some people are just very creative people that just like to make things without being boxed in by some concept of you know accuracy or, or authenticity for me personally i want to replicate near i nearly always want to nearly always want to replicate the screen use costumes as closely as as possible and i want my replica costumes to look like they just came off the set or out of the wardrobe department and i don't always enjoy that as much as I might if it were a more casual project, but it's what gives me the most personal satisfaction as a as a costumer. And and that's where I'm coming from with my patterns and tutorials. And I think my resources tend to attract people with similar costuming values or goals. But not everyone wants to do what I do. And uh, some people want to make their own costume designs. You know, they don't want, they're not interested in recreating the work of others. They want to make their own yes. things. And some people like to do costume mashups from different shows or movies or IPs or, or, or whatever. So that's a, that's a big subjective thing. Some people want to uh, make costume adaptations from cartoons or anime or, or things like that. And there's a huge room for interpretation with that too. So it's a personal thing. And if you don't, already know like what appeals to you i think it's the kind of thing that you just learn about yourself over time i'm sure some people read my tutorials and they're like wow and others are just like yeah i'm, I'm not doing that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know and, and and it's fair enough it's about whatever it's about whatever works for you it's about whatever appeals to you and whatever you enjoy you know you you do you but if if the kind of thing that you want to do is the same kind of thing that i do then i'm happy you know to help with my patterns and tutorials and all my resources and upcoming courses and and everything you know i want to make these accessible to to people who do share this goal of making quote unquote accurate 
costumes. I did want to ask you about your courses that you're developing at Taylor's Gone Wild. Okay. So you are you are developing some sewing classes, and I think that it's great how you're connecting these to costume creation. And could you talk about that a little bit? I write sewing tutorials to go with my patterns, and I post these tutorials online for free. I'm a I'm a DIY guy, and my niche is really helping other DIY and aspiring DIY customers and the courses that i'm working on the sewing and tailoring courses they they really grew out of a desire to more effectively help those who want to learn how to sew especially those who want to learn how to sew costumes but maybe they don't know where to start once upon a time i had grand dreams of making costumes i loved from shows and movies i loved but i had no idea how to thread a sewing machine how to make a bobbin. I didn't know what seam allowance was, you know, just to say nothing of in, installing a, a zipper, you know, or, or structuring a jacket. That was just uh, so far above and beyond what any, anything I knew. Well, I didn't even know where to start. And the courses that I'm working on for Taylor's Gone Wild are what I wish I would have had when I was getting started, when I was uh, figuring everything out in about as hard a way as you could possibly figure it out. <laughs> Uh, so like right from the beginning with the beginner sewing course, we discuss different types of fabric and what they're usually used for different types of thread, sewing machine basics, how to use sewing patterns, sewing basic seams, all the essential sewing skills, the, the foundational things with the intermediate sewing course. We take things up a notch with fitting techniques like darts, uh, princess seams, stretch seams, basic pattern alterations. We cover things like zippers and shirt plackets, which incidentally, I actually use a slight adaptation of David Coffin's technique, which I love his shirt placket. Oh, technique. yeah. So, long time threads editor. Yeah. 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 His, he's, he's great. Uh, or, or was great. May he yes, yes. rest in peace. Um, so anyway, that's where I learned short plackets, passing that along. Uh, in the advanced sewing course, we dive deeper into specialty seams, pleats, quilting, custom-made pipings and trim, and professional finishing. And then in the tailoring course, that's where the magic really happens. The structuring and shaping garments, working with pattern fabrics like stripes and plaids, collars and lapels, strategically reducing bulk around a garment. Each course builds on the previous material. So, you know, what I'm going for with these is uh, helping people along their journey of learning to sew, and especially those who want to sew costumes. How are so, What are some ways that you've made these classes, um, that you've made the connection between these classes and costuming rather than them just being basic sewing classes or traditional sewing classes? Um, well, a big way is whenever possible. Um, well, two things that are kind of the same, two sides of the same coin. When I was in school and people, my teachers would teach things, they never, almost never explained to me why this was important or when I was ever going to use this. And it drove me crazy because I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. Like I said, in my other life, I'm a media composer, or I don't know if I said that, but I'm a, I'm a composer. I knew that's what I wanted to be when I grew up and everything. Um, and they were teaching me all the stuff I didn't care about. And I never had any, they never gave me a reason to care about it or think it was important or I was ever going to use it. So uh, in every sewing lesson, I give examples of why I think this is an important uh, sewing skill or technique or whatever whatever, uh, where you might use it, on what kind of a garment you might use it. And whenever possible, I demonstrate on a, a costume example, usually a, a nerdy costume example too, you know, like a Star Trek uniform or or something more general, like a, like a Renaissance-y costume that you might wear to a Renaissance festival or, or something like that. Like every, every chance I get, I'm, I'm showing here's how you do a, a gathered seam. Here's a gathered seam on a Renaissance shirt. You know, here's how to install a sleeve cap. Here's a sleeve cap on a tailored jacket. Here's how to uh, do some top stitching. Here's some top stitching on a, an enterprise jumpsuit, you know, whatever that sure. kind of thing. So, so here, here's how to top stitch a, a patch. You know, here's a original series, Star Trek patch, you know, like they had sewn onto their 
tunics, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. So, so I, I've tried to uh, clearly show that uh, this is not a tremendous waste of time. This is, <laughs> this is, this is something you're making, that you're, you're making you'll, clear connections along the way. Yeah. Right. This is probably something you're going to use at some point on your sewing journey with some kind of a costume or something that you're going to make. And, you know, maybe you'll use all of it. Maybe you won't, but there's, there's takeaway value. Uh, I've tried to put as much value as possible into every lesson, every, every video tried to clearly show uh, how this is practically useful, not just academically. And unlike my tutorials, they're they're very costume specific, right? Which is part of why I was amazed when people say they've learned to sew from my tutorials because, you know, I'm very detailed with those, but they're costume specific, right? Like with right. the TNG jumpsuit, it's like, you, now you know everything about sewing a TNG jumpsuit, but you certainly like you don't know everything about sewing. Like if you <laughs> if you learned everything you know about sewing just just from from that, you would know how to make like one thing, right? But the the courses that I'm working on, they're, they're it's a much broader journey of um you learn most of what i know about sewing so instead of learning how to make a costume you're learning how to make almost any costume that you could want to make well alex it's been so fascinating talking with you but we're getting close to the end of our time but i did want to i did want to ask you something uh you know you have your your personal fandom for the, some of these shows uh you have these great analytical skills to look at these screen worn costumes why is it so important to you to share that with an audience who's maybe not as well informed and, and you know and doesn't have the the sewing background? Well, um, let me let me think. For part of it is definitely that I, I'm an overachiever, right? And I throw myself everything into everything that I do to me, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing as well as I possibly can. Um, I don't know if you've watched parks and recreation or not, but, um, Leslie, no, I was just going to say, are you, are you a bit of a Leslie? No, <laughs> I am absolutely <laughs> Leslie. Nope. I, I, I really, I relate to her on a, on like a deep personal level. And earlier I mentioned, you know, my first couple patterns that, that I'd bought as a teenager and how they, they turned me off of sewing for years. And, the patterns themselves were iffy. Uh, one piece was missing seam allowance, which is a major monkey wrench when you barely even know what seam allowance is. Uh, one piece was missing entirely. It just like, it wasn't even with the pattern. Right. <laughs> and, uh, the instructions were just terrible. Uh, I hardly understood a word of them because I mean, uh, I was in over my head. There were, there were no diagrams, no images of every kind. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a very visual learner. So between the, the, the pattern and the instructions, it was just an incredibly frustrating experience for me. And when enthusiasm and excitement turn sour, it, it's just, it's really discouraging, you know? And right, well, those costumes, they were, they were admittedly, they were well beyond my skill level at the time, but I'd honestly felt better before I even tried to make them because at least then I believed that I could <laughs> after, yeah. after I tried, like the experience left me feeling like my dream of having a Star Trek costume was more inaccessible than ever. Right. Like it, it left me you know, feeling really bad about sewing and everything. So right from my very first pattern, I vowed to myself that I would do everything I could to make sure nobody ever had that kind of experience with my patterns. I know a lot of these costumes can seem confusing or overwhelming to figure out. And believe me, I, <laughs> I know. Uh, so I decided to do a free sewing tutorial to go with each pattern, which of course, you know, like I mentioned before, I post these online for free so people can read through them before they even decide whether or not they want to actually buy the pattern, let alone try and make it, you know, so, so they can familiarize themselves or decide if this is too involved for them or if they think they can do this or, or whatever. And uh, a project may be beyond someone's current skill level, but I don't want anyone to ever feel demotivated or disheartened after using one of my sewing patterns. I want my patterns and, and resources and like I said, the courses grew out of this too. Um, but I want to, I, I want my patterns and resources to be encouraging and empowering and maybe even an educational experience for people, definitely educational with the, with the courses, but I, I want to help people make their costuming and, and cosplay dreams 
come true and to make these costumes accessible to a degree that they've, you know, maybe never been before. You know, I, I want, I, I want, in a nutshell, I want it to be a good experience for them. I want to do everything I can to provide that good experience. Oh, Alex, I think it really comes across in your content. And of, and of course, that's our mission at Threads too, to, to make sewing as, as fun and enjoyable and educational as possible. So I want to encourage our audience to take a look at the show notes for this episode because we're going to have a lot of uh, photos of work that Alex has done. And we'll have links to your social media, Alex, um, Taylor's Gone Wild, and your YouTube channel, too. Awesome. It's been great talking with you. I feel like I should say uh, live long and prosper. Yeah. Yeah. To to you as well. Just as a, as a, as one final, final beat, uh, I would like to just say, um, you know, we, we've covered a lot today, but we've really just barely scratched the, the surface of, you know, costuming and, and cosplay. There's, there's so much more room for people to, you know, explore things and express themselves. And most of what we've talked about has been very like academic and, and personal and philosophical even but for anyone interested in more practical sewing skills you know i think threads magazine is a is a great resource like you said like what you try and do i think what, what you all do is great i've learned a lot from threads over the years even even now you know sometimes i google things and and threads comes up so i just i i want to uh you know commend you i tip my i tip my hat to my imaginary hat i'm not wearing <laughs> thank a hat. you I tip my thank hat. you i, I will accept that threads. compliment thank you yeah and um i also i'd happily recommend uh Books by Kenneth King and David Coffin, two two Threads contributors who've done fantastic work. Um, there's a lot of free material and resources on my sewing and costuming blogs. My most popular one, obviously, is uh, StarTrekCostumeGuide.com. If you're if you're interested in that, and of course the sewing and tailoring courses I'm working on, they'll be available soon at TaylorScottMild.com. So I just wanted to mention all that, you know, for more practical. Uh, if anyone wants more practical. Uh, uh, take away or whatever you know definitely oh, check thank you check for mentioning those resources yeah yeah if you if you want to learn to sew specifically to sew costumes you know i think my courses are a great place to start but again tip my tip my hat <laughs> to threads thank you thanks alex it's been great talking with you yeah thank you for having me i've enjoyed i've enjoyed being here thank you so much thank you for listening follow threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads.